encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. If you want to be a serious Bible student, a successful servant, and a powerful preacher, this is the podcast for you. Hello and welcome to Preachers in Training. My name is Robert Hatfield. This is the podcast on which we discuss all things preaching and ministry. Coming up on today's episode, we're talking about why preachers need a good theological foundation. Here to help us discuss this vitally important topic is Dr. Donnie DeBoard, Assistant Professor of Bible at Freed Hardeman and a gospel preacher and wearer of many hats. Welcome, brother. Glad to Thank have you. you here today. Thank you, Robert. I'm so excited about this. and appreciate your work on this podcast so uh, much. I know you've done a lot of good, and the Brotherhood really appreciates this good well, work. I appreciate you saying that. It's it's a joy. I tell people it's kind of selfish because yeah. I enjoy the conversations. <laughs> it helps yeah. my ministry, yeah. so it's good to well, have it. That's them. a great, great program. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, theology, uh, a nice broad topic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, study of God, God, very broadly stated, yeah. but um, often by invoking the term, we may mean a, a system of academic study that is perhaps mm. a little more focused than just study of God, broadly speaking, right? Right. Um, as, as we dive into this today, I mean, we're obviously emphasizing preachers need to be theologians. Mm -hmm. We need to be theologically thinking or minded in that way. Um, I know you've spent a good portion of your studies and things uh, devoted to theology. You want right. us to give us a little bit of your background, and then we can dive into maybe defining sure. some terms and things sure. like that? Uh, well, I think we were in school together. You may be a year uh, younger, a year or two younger than I am, mm -hmm. but uh, we continued uh, here at Fried Hardman, and I graduated with an MA and then the MDiv here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, just a little bit after that, I went on to Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and I earned a Master of Theology, which is a step above a, a Master of Divinity, and then mm -hmm. finally completed my PhD in Systematic Theology. Uh, just a few months ago, and so thankful to have all of that back. Uh, my <laughs> dissertation was a critique of uh, Neo-Apollinarianism from a classical theist perspective, and that was a, just an incredibly rewarding and rich uh, field, and I have thoroughly mm. enjoyed uh, teaching systematic theology and um, biblical studies here at Fried Hardeman. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the students, whenever we stop uh, the section on uh, the doctrine of God, they'll say, you know, it's like I never who knew who God was before. Wow. And it's just so uh, moving and a mm -hmm. reminder every semester of why I want to do this so that people can know God. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, helps us to segue into what systematic theology really is. You know, he said it was a really broad topic. Yeah. And that's interesting because uh, my favorite definition of systematic theology is the study of God and the uh, relation of everything to God. Mm. So it really is sort of the broadest uh, field yeah. that you could get into and in one way of looking at it, mm -hmm. the study of God and the uh, relation of God, or relation of everything to God. Mm -hmm. And really, this is the way we live, isn't it? We think mm. about God and then we think about everything else, or mm. usually we think about everything else and then maybe we'll start to think <laughs> about God in, yeah. in return. Yeah. So the question is not if we're going to be theologians, the question is, are we going to be good theologians? Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we've got to start thinking about God first. Now this is what theology really is. Theology is from two Greek words, it means the study of God. And whenever we think about uh, theology, uh, we're really a bit more focused perhaps than we think. Uh, if you want to talk about the nature of God, you know, before creation, if you just want to talk about the nature of God itself, the old uh, way of doing that is to talk about theologia. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a, a Latinized form of the Greek word for theology. And it's just about the doctrine of God himself, mm -hmm. who God is before creation. Now, this is where most of my focus has been recently. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of my interest has been on Christology and how Jesus remains true God, mm -hmm. even though he takes on this uh, human nature as well. But whenever you begin to think about who God is, his essence, then you can begin to look at all of creation appropriately. It's sort of like, this is the way I compare it with my students, uh, you talk to uh, your parents. And mm -hmm. usually whenever you think about your parents, you just think about your parents for as long as they've been parents. And you yeah. forget that they were actually people uh, before <laughs> that. Uh, but as you get older and you want a more mature relationship with your parents, you've got to understand 
who they were before you came along. Mm -hmm. And so if we're really going to understand God, it's important for us to understand our triune God even before creation. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that we can know about God before creation. Um, we see this in Acts 17, beautifully displayed, for example. But as we think about this, then we know who God is. We can better know who we're supposed to be, who God mm -hmm. made us to be, why we exist, why we are here. Mm -hmm. So my first definition for systematic theology would just be the study of God and then everything in relation to who God is. This really is the way creation should be ordered. It's the way our lives should be ordered. Mm -hmm. But another definition um, that comes to us from a German theologian named Gerhardus Voss, uh, he, he said that theology or systematic theology is the science of living to God. The hmm. science of living to God. Now, I really love that one, too, mm -hmm. because it focuses on how that systematic theology is not just this uh, big intellectual endeavor. Uh, throughout history, up until the Enlightenment, when things got kind of weird, uh, people understood <laughs> that uh, systematic theology was the queen of the sciences, that mm. everything else serves systematic theology, mm -hmm. because this is the study of God, and then how we're supposed to live, Kondo, or in the face of God, or before God. Now, then, as we begin to look at theology, and we begin to think about our lives as ministers, as churchgoers, as Christians, as parents and husbands and wives, then we can orient our lives appropriately to know who God is and then to live in light of God, to live as though we are living in his presence because mm -hmm. the great secret of Christianity is that we are. We're living in God's presence all the time and we want to behave appropriately. We want to worship appropriately. And the only way we can really do this, I think, is if we better know who God is and then understand how we are supposed to live. It gives us that anchor that mm -hmm. we can... Uh, root our lives to and the foundation that we can build upon. Once we know who God is, then everything else begins to fall in line. Uh, we see this, uh, I'm getting too preachy. No, uh, this is good. Uh, we see We're this, preachers here. It's all okay. good. <laughs> we see this a lot uh, in questions about Bible authority. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question and people wonder, you know, what is it I should do? How should I respond? How should I react to this question? When the first question should always be, who is God and what has God said? Mm. That always needs to be the root rather than how do I feel, what do I like, what do I want, what do I think this should be like? Mm -hmm. We always need to go back to what has God said, what is God like? And then our answer is probably already given. The question then is just if we're going to like the answer that yeah. God has given for us. Uh, but we need to orient our lives such a way that God is at the center, that God is the focus. Uh, and this is the way all creation is supposed to be. And systematic theology helps us to do that mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm. I love that. Uh, you know, as preachers, we're not just calling people to a set of arbitrary rules right. or, uh, you know, e even into a fellowship or like this brotherhood of some secret society where, you know, if you conform, then we'll let you in. Mm -hmm. We're sharing the heart of God and, right. and, and inviting people to be drawn to him. Mm -hmm rather than to ourselves. Right. Uh, sometimes, maybe because we don't think as theologically as we should, right. we end up reducing it down to just a bunch of rules, or, or maybe unintentionally, mm -hmm. because we don't emphasize the theological component as much as we should, right. our hearers hear just that. Right. We need to be careful about that, don't we? Whenever I, I, I really appreciate that question or mm -hmm. your, your insight there, because we have a tendency to reduce Christianity to rule keeping or yeah. to moralism, and this really is the result of uh, robbing God of His position in our life. You, you, you see, you, mm -hmm. like your marriage, mm -hmm. uh, you love your wife because she's your wife, not because you know you want to do all these things to make her happy or to keep her happy. Yeah. But you love your wife, and so you treat her in a special way. Mm -hmm. You love her as Christ loved the church, and we are able to see better then how to love the Lord and why it is we do all these things because we know him and we love him mm -hmm. our savior said this is eternal life that they might know you and your son whom you have sent uh, we also see like in acts chapter 2 you know we preach acts 238 a lot and we should we need to this mm -hmm. is how we become christians but the sermon begins in verse 21 mm -hmm. and peter's been preaching the christ and this is why the people cry out what shall we do 
because they had this emphasis upon who Jesus is, mm -hmm. uh, his, his divinity, his resurrection. And now then the people are crying out. They're interrupting the sermon. How can I be saved? I wonder maybe if we could have some better results if we focused more on who God is mm -hmm. and then explain this is what you're having to do That's right. because of who God is. Not just because, you know, I said you got to do it or God said you got to do it, right. but focusing on who God is, then it compels us to want to do these things. And that mm -hmm. moves us uh, from moralism or just rule keeping. You know, no one just loves paying their taxes. <laughs> I found yeah. that the more that I focus on the Lord, the more that I love giving, the more that mm. I love the Lord's Supper, the more I love going to worship, the more I enjoy the work of the church because I know God just a little bit better. Uh, that motivates me, uh, same way with your other relationships that you have. But without that relationship, it's easily reduced just to moralism, and we've seen that in our culture. Yeah. Uh, we have today, uh, the technical phrase for it is moral therapeutic deism, mm. uh, that we see rampant in our churches, where we have a lot of how-to messages, how to have a better life, how to have better finances, and you'll have a better you know, family if you come to church, but we've lost the focus. Mm -hmm. And all those how-to messages are good, but we've lost the heart of the gospel, which is Christ, which is God. And so when we know him better, then we're going to want to do all these things and we'll enjoy life better right. because we have him. We think about Job, for example. He, he lost everything, but he was faithful because he knew the Lord. He mm -hmm. had this devotion to him. And that's what we need to reclaim, uh, mm -hmm. this devotion to God. Rather than rule keeping or moralism or just a lot of how to, we want to know who we want to know why mm. that's so very important as a motivator and then also is uh, that which keeps us saintly sanctified yeah. because we want to be with the lord because we love him so much we mm -hmm. want to do whatever he says we need to do and it's his power that brings about the change and his blessings that bring about then the desired result right sometimes in those how-to kind of messages i love good practical messages as much as anybody does but right. we sort of skip to the end blessing Right. And take away the power behind all yeah. that blessing. You get to the how to, but you forgot the what for. The what for. There yeah. you go. Uh, yeah. and the what for has always got to be the Lord. Yeah. I know you've got several several reasons, in fact, seven or so, and maybe we've stepped on some of those in, uh, in some ways. But um, we've used this term systematic, and you've mentioned that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. theology among the two best definitions that you enjoy, uh, it's all encompassing. When we talk about systematic, is that essentially what we mean when we say that word systematic theology? Sort of. It's, it's uh, looking at the Bible, uh, not just going from Genesis to Revelation and exegeting every verse, mm -hmm. but instead of going uh, linear, it's more of having this bird's eye view of everything all at once. Mm -hmm. and so whatever God has said about this particular doctrine, we're going to look at it all at one time. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps we could look at it this way. Uh, in order to have a good theological method, this is what we talk about, we want to start with exegesis. Mm -hmm. We start with studying the text, knowing what God has said in this particular verse. Okay, mm -hmm. And then we can expand from that particular text to maybe that theme uh, in the Gospel of John or yeah. all of John's writings or all of the New Testament or the entire Bible. Yeah. And so as we begin to move from exegesis to this more thematic study that's called biblical theology, mm -hmm. where we trace a theme across a book or an author or across the entire canon, this is biblical theology where we're getting all of the data together. But systematic theology has to do with summarizing all of that data so that we know what we are supposed to do. And so rather than just being descriptive, systematic theology is also prescriptive. Mm -hmm. It's saying in light of everything that God has said, this is what we are to know, this is what we are to believe, this is what we're to practice and preach. Mm -hmm. And so there is this all-encompassing view. That's why the uh, definition that systematic theology is the study of God and everything as it relates to God is held on so well mm -hmm. um, because it really is about everything. Yeah. Uh, it starts from, uh, you, you know, you get a good systematic theology. It's going to cover the presuppositions that we have as we think about God, as mm -hmm. we come to the text, the nature of God, apologetics now, and then moving on to different doctrinal emphases that we need to be aware of, uh, mm -hmm. moving all the way from the nature of God into the study of last things or eschatology. Yeah. So a good systematic theology is going to cover all of those things uh, for us as a great guide, right? A guide for understanding everything in Scripture. 
But then at the same time, as you're studying scripture, you're always improving your own personal guide, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's cyclical. You learn something, you've got some tools there to help you know what you're supposed to understand there. But as you learn, you're always building on this other side too, so mm-hmm. that you can grow better and more precise in your understanding of God and, and then what you're supposed to do. So that's Perfect. what systematic theology is. How do you distinguish systematic theology from just topical Bible study? Okay. Uh, what, what would you say the difference between those two are? It depends. Mm-hmm. It depends on a lot of different things. Um, there's going to be some similarities, mm-hmm. uh, but systematic theology, uh, like last Sunday, I preached on uh, the doctrine of baptism. Mm-hmm. And what I did was just do a biblical theology of baptism from the New Testament. started mm-hmm. in uh, Matthew and went from uh, Matthew to John all the way over to Revelation. This is mm-hmm. what the Bible says about baptism. And that's going to be a very thematic study. But if you're going to really do it in a systematic way, uh, you're going to take that uh, thematic study from Scripture. You're going to take your exegesis. But then you're also going to move into how does this relate back to God? What does God the Father have to do with my baptism? What does God the Son have to do with my baptism? What does the Holy Spirit have to do with my baptism? And now, having done that... How am I going to relate this to the future? Mm-hmm. What about my life in the present? What about my life tomorrow? What about my life in the resurrection? Mm-hmm. Uh, all of these things are going to be tied into a, a more theological view of baptism, for example. And you can do this. You should do this with every doctrine. Yeah. Uh, but a more topical sermon is not going to have that reach. Mm-hmm. It's just not. You're not going to have the time. You're not going to have the, the audience that's willing to go through that at one time. And you just you can't do it in a more sermon of fashion. Mm -hmm. Uh, This Mm -hmm. is a a more academic, perhaps more intellectual thing that you want to have more in a Bible class situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, This has been really good to do uh, that way. Uh, I'm not saying don't do it in preaching. Uh, It's just going to require a lot more time. Yeah. You got to lay somewhat of a foundation first. So it's maybe a little more focused than just topical study. It's going to be more focused, but at the same time, it's also going to be more expansive. Understood. Got it. Well, let's dive in, and, and if we've mentioned already some of these seven, we can just briefly okay. min- mention them. But uh, w- w- I think you have for us seven reasons why we ought to study systematic theology. And we'll just okay. group them this way for the sake of the listeners. It'll be a little easier maybe to see yeah. these bullet points. <laughs> we, I've taken him off script so far, everyone. So uh, I appreciate you rolling with me. We, we've covered a good, uh, a little bit of them already. <laughs> That's good. Well, uh, you want to just sort of list yeah. several of them for us, and no, then the we first, can dive into yeah, the ones the we have. The first one is just because we're going to live theologically. Yeah. You think about all the great questions that we've got going on. I mean, you just watch the news and all of those things going on, the big the big things in the news, all of mm-hmm. these are theological questions. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the reversal of Roe versus Wade, uh, anything going on in, in the economic realm or government. All of these things are theological questions when you get down to the root of it. What is a person? When do you become a person? Mm. We need to know what God says. And mm-hmm. you cannot escape the fact that these are theological questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you talk about how to raise your family, what a marriage is. All of these are theological questions. And so we're all going to be theologians. Mm-hmm. We can try to deny God, but Everyone believes in some sort of higher power, some sort of another. Mm -hmm. They believe that there is a reason for their existence. And whenever you begin to slip into that way of thinking or you recognize that this uh, confession, that there is some reason why you're there, someone made you to be there, Mm -hmm. as soon as you begin to think about that greater reality, you're beginning to think theologically. You're beginning to affirm that there is some sort of a God. And then it's only then when you recognize that I need to be a good theologian. Mm. I need to think about these things well. And so we want to have a theology of personhood Mm. that informs the abortion question. We want to have a theology of personhood that informs the question of identity. Uh, These things are theological questions. And so they're right at the forefront every single day in the news. Mm -hmm. But these are theological questions, and they deserve to have a church that's theologically trained to answer them. Uh, People are coming to their ministers, and they want to know, what does God say about these things? And Mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to be able to show them from Scripture, this is who God is, this is who God made us to be, and now this is what our life should look like uh, in light of those facts. So we're all going to be theologians. Whether or not we want to be (laughs) or we think we are, we are all going to be theologians. Mm -hmm. That's the unique perspective maybe that as ministers, as people come, hey, you can watch the news 24-7, you can go and read political pundits, you can you know, refer to cultural ana- uh, you know, analysis and all of that. Um, 
we ought to be the voices of reasoning, the voices of grounding. We're not running around like the world is burning down. Uh, we understand there are theological answers to these questions, that God is certainly displeased with a good majority of what's going on. At the same time, God has a plan, and we go from there, right? Okay. Very good. Very good. good. All right. Number two. Number two. We're going to uh, be theologians because we are concerned with truth. Mm. We are concerned with truth. Now that dovetails into the the one we've already been talking about. Mm -hmm. In our society, we have this uh, idea that we can all have our own personal truth. Yeah. That's one of the major things going on right now. Well, I can trace that back to a theologian named Frederick Schleiermacher. Mm. He really sort of uh, furthered that idea uh, after Enlightenment thinking, but. Uh, Whenever we think about truth, or the nature of truth, what truth is, what's right, these are theological questions. You mm. know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and mm. the life. So if we're going to know what right is, we need to know who God is. If mm. we're going to understand how that we should address these things, both the how and the answer to these questions, we need to know who God is. And that is the main focus of theology. Everything else flows from that. Mm. And so we want to know who God is. But then secondly, uh, the Bible says, thy word is truth. And so if we're going to know the right answer, we've got to go back to the Bible. Mm. Our questions and our answers have all got to be God-centered, and they all need to be Bible-focused, Bible-founded. So that we're going back to Scripture, we know what God has said on this, and we can then live that way and tell others how to live the way that God wants us to live, because his word is truth. He's mm. the highest authority, and this is what we want to go with. Mm -hmm. So we want to uh, know truth, and so it's inevitable that we're going to be theologians. Mm -hmm. All philosophers have something to say about theology. Uh, the problem comes in when philosophers begin to rule theology. You know, our brother Thomas B. Warren mm -hmm. uh, said that philosophy had led theology around by the nose. Mm. Uh, and that was true after the Enlightenment. Before the Enlightenment, that was not true. Not the way it was. Uh, but we definitely want to have good, God-centered answers to these big questions. We want to have true answers to these big questions, all questions. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find them in God. We're going to find them in His Word. His Word is truth, and this is the only hope that we really have. Wow. All right, where do we go from here? Number three. All right, number three, because we want to know God. Hmm. We want to know God. Uh, this is, you know, when I went into systematic theology, I, I didn't realize that this was going to be the main part. Hmm. But this has been the biggest blessing for me, is just to know God better. I felt like I knew a lot of things I had to do. Mm -hmm. I felt like I knew a lot of facts about the Lord, but I didn't really know God. Mm -hmm. And so our theology should always lead to doxology. It should mm -hmm. always lead to praise. And the more that I begin to dive into the nature of God itself, who He, just who He is, mm -hmm. not just what He's done for me, uh, not what He requires of me, mm -hmm. but just to know God, this has been the greatest blessing uh, in this academic study, but it's, you can't separate it. Yeah. It's not just an academic study. It's a spiritual study. Mm -hmm. It is a theology that's for the church. It's for the Christian. And so as you begin to uh, dive into who the Lord is, then you can't help, right? Our Lord said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Now, mm -hmm. I think he's primarily speaking about the crucifixion. Sure. But as we lift him up, not just what he has done, but lift him up, then we're going to fall in love with him all the more. I emphasize this to my students as they are in dating relationships mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, a lot of times someone will like you just because of all the good stuff you do for them. <laughs> that's not a healthy relationship. Mm. That, that's not somebody that you want to keep. But sometimes we treat the Lord that way. Mm -hmm. We love the Lord because he does all that good stuff for us. And you think about the different hymns that we sing. Mm -hmm. It really shows up. How many times do we actually praise God just because he's God? Right. Uh, but as you begin to focus and set aside time to really meditate on what God has revealed to us about himself, then you're loving him for him, not just because of what he's done, yeah. but loving him because of his nature, because of who he is, and then everything else. Everything else is just falls in line. It's mm -hmm. just awesome the way that uh, Christianity works when you love the Lord uh, rather than just right. whatever else it is you've fallen in love with. And we as preachers need to be the people leading the way in this way. I think often there are some in, in the pews, so to speak, who will say, well, just give me that practical sermon or tell right. me what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to model uh, 
our love for the Lord and maybe ignite a fire in that way, but at the same time to demonstrate as best we can that mm-hmm. uh, even if we come away from a sermon only with a deeper devotion to God or a greater appreciation for what it means that God is God, right. that's practical. Oh, yeah. And uh, that, that's could something be more practical than that. Exactly. Right. We need to model that as preachers. Right. Uh, just to really fall in love with the Lord. Yeah. Um, sometimes maybe we're we're too um, too much in our head. Right. And we don't allow our hearts to really just fall in love with Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons why we have the Scripture. That we can get to know the Lord and see how He's uh, acted with folks in the mm-hmm. past through history, and then we can just love Him all the more, just like you do with your spouse. It's not mm-hmm. you know it's, it's not just about what they do. It's about who they are. Yeah. And if you love your spouse for who they are. Everything else, it's just it's just butter. It. Everything else yeah. is the best. Right? I like that. Yeah. That's got to be what Jesus is getting at, right, in John 17, when he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Right. And we think, that sounds simple. Yeah. Uh, it, it, well, it's much deeper than it may yeah. seem on the surface. It's but, this yeah. inexhaustible source of adoration. Yeah. Uh, Martin Luther said that we can understand God about as well as a ladybug can understand us. <laughs> Uh, but you know it doesn't stop those ladybugs i don't know why ladybugs love churches but they love churches they get in there and they'll start flying around uh but it it shouldn't stop us from just admiring god just being in awe of him Mm. and this is what we must do if we're going to do anything else this is what we must do Mm -hmm. all right we should study systematic theology because we want to know god Uh, what's number four on the list here to understand scripture Mm. to understand scripture um I, I really worry sometimes about the way I hear a lot of folks talking about God. Mm. Uh, but if we're going to understand Scripture, we need to have Scripture show us how to understand God and Scripture to teach us how to understand Scripture. Mm. Uh, sometimes I Imagine hear, that. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I hear folks talking about how Jesus stopped being God mm-hmm. or he uh, relinquished his divine attributes. This is a heresy called Apollinarianism that mm-hmm. you mentioned I wrote about. Yeah. And we want to be very careful not to fall into that sort of thinking so that we understand that God, uh, God the Son, is true God. And mm-hmm. that's what makes his sacrifice uh, valuable. Like yeah. in Acts 20 and 28 when he says that God purchased the church with his own blood, mm. that his sacrifice was effective because he was true God. He didn't stop being God. Yeah. And then that's just an example of things yeah. that... Uh, help you to better understand what's going on. Uh, in my Life of Christ classes, I always like to start with emphasizing the nature of God because it's when we understand God that we can really appreciate this, wow, God came to the world? Right. God came and dwelt among us? That's why John starts his gospel that way, as to emphasize the divine aspect of this, that he is true God and he dwelt among us. Yeah. This is incredible. Yeah. It's absolutely. absolutely incredible. Right. If you have a, a theological grounding, mm-hmm. then these things, these truths become so much richer as you're reading them. You can appreciate them so much better. Mm-hmm. I found when, uh, you know, trying to preach like Philippians 2, 5 to 11 or something like that. And, you know, uh, there's some of that stuff I just don't understand how it happened. Yeah. Uh, what I personally try and default to is never to make Jesus seem like lesser mm-hmm. than who he is. Mm-hmm. And even if that means for that, I sometimes say, I don't exactly know how all this shook down in the particulars, right. but I know this, mm-hmm. he's Emmanuel, he's God mm-hmm. with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, we got to be really careful not to do yeah. anything that demeans either God right. or Jesus during his earthly ministry. Right. Uh, we, we cannot allow ourselves to stop referring to Jesus as God. Right. One of the neat things I saw was a survey or some statistics that came out. In the last hundred years or so, mm. the most popular way that people referred to our Lord is Jesus. Mm-hmm. But before that time, uh, the most popular word was Christ. Mm. And I think it's because we have emphasized the humanity more yeah. uh, rather than the deity. Uh, but that's just an interesting yeah. uh, thing. And I see that a lot. Mm-hmm. I see that as I listen to folks in the pew, listen to folks in the pulpit. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of things that uh, need some uh, correcting, uh, need some you know more foundation mm-hmm. so that we can understand God better and so that we don't drift off into some heretical movement that mm-hmm. we really don't want to be a part of mm-hmm. because these heretical movements, by and large, are diminishing God. Mm. Uh, this is at the heart of all of them. They're bringing God down from his creator level 
to a creaturely level. Mm. And if we're going to live for God's glory, we need to understand that God is glorious. Mm. To understand that better, as I've said over and over again, you understand who God is. Life just is so much sweeter. Mm-hmm. The Christian life is so much better, so improved, so much more enthusiasm and so much more submission as well. Yeah. Uh, because you better know who God is. Mm. It's almost like you're trying to make a point here. I, I, I'm <laughs> sensing a theme. <laughs> no, this is good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't help it. Yeah, no, that's, I'm, I'm glad you are. Number five, where do we go from here? Well, just moving on from that, mm-hmm. uh, because we're commanded to think theologically. Mm. We are commanded to think theologically. Like Psalm 27, 4, uh, one of my favorite systematic theology passages. <laughs> uh, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Mm. I want to get that framed. I, I'm, I'm so very blessed and humbled because I get to be a professional theologian, as it were. Mm. I get to do that verse every day. Mm-hmm. But Christians get to do that every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're a mother with a little baby, you know, wrangling in the pew, yeah. you're still getting to do that too. Right. Whatever's going on, we need to focus on the Lord. So we need to meditate on him. We need to think theologically. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is uh, this thing that I'm going through? How does it relate to God? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's one of the things that I ask my students to do whenever they're doing their Bible study. You know, you do your exegesis, but your exegesis isn't over until you recognize and think about, uh, what does this text teach me about the Lord? What does it teach about God the Father, about God the Son, God the Spirit? Mm -hmm. What does it teach me about what I have to do for them, what it means for my life, and then about my future? Mm -hmm. So we begin to think theologically. Uh, Psalm 1, verse 2, the the blessed man delights in the law of the Lord and his meditation all day and night. Mm -hmm. So we want to continue uh, thinking about God. Now, this is uh, maybe a little counterintuitive uh, because we want to be active. Mm -hmm. Uh, We want to be out there doing something. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's similar to the way we look at prayer. We we think sometimes that uh, we don't have time to pray because we've got so much to do. Uh, but that's really backward, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. If we've got a lot to do, we need to be praying a lot more. Mm-hmm. And the more that we want to accomplish in the church, the more we need to lift God up. Mm. Not just what you have to do, but who it is that we're serving, who it is that saved us, and who it is that we worship. These things are compelling. Mm-hmm. So we want to focus on the Lord. Uh, again, Psalm 143, 5, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands, Joshua 1, 8. Uh, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so mm-hmm. that you may be careful to do. You see how it's transitioned. You know what to do because you've been thinking theologically. Yeah. Uh, look at Job. You know, Job is in suffering so much, and what he's praying for is this mediator mm-hmm. that would stand between him and God. He says, I wish that there was someone that could put a hand on me and a hand on God, right? The whole time I'm reading it, I'm like shouting to Job. There's Jesus. It's <laughs> yeah. our Christ, our Savior. He's coming. He's God and man. Uh, but as we're suffering, I think uh, reading Job can be so very helpful because yeah. we're beginning to think theologically about Jesus' suffering. Mm-hmm. Like Hebrews two seventeen, he became like us in every respect so that he could be this merciful high priest so that we can understand suffering, we can understand life, we can understand obligation, we can understand our identity mm. because we're beginning to think theologically. Yeah. Uh, number next, if I'll just move yeah, on. Yeah, that's good, number yeah. six. Uh, because we're going to worship. Mm. We are going to worship. Uh, G.K. Beale has this great l- uh, book out. I almost said great little book, but Beale <laughs> doesn't write little book. Uh, but G.K. <laughs> Beale has this great book out titled, We Become What We Worship. Mm-hmm. That is so very true. Apostle Paul defined uh, idolatry as covetousness. Mm -hmm. And so this is really the great way of looking at paganism. Uh, You're just finding something that you like, that you want to worship. And this is what you become, Mm -hmm. right? If you worship uh, professional basketball players, you might try to become one. Mm Uh, I'm not tall enough for that. Uh, if you worship, <laughs> work. <laughs> if you worship, you know, uh, the PGA Tour golfers, mm-hmm. you're going to try and become that. So if you worship God, you might try to become godly. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is really so much more important, isn't it? So you will become whatever it is that you worship. So we want to worship God, mm-hmm. not ourselves or our own desires. Uh, again, I know I've mentioned this before, but one of sort of the scary things is just to look at the hymns that we sing most often. And most of the hymns that we sing, I'm afraid, have more to do with what we want, the life that we want, the future that we want, 
rather than actually praising God. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to maybe switch that a bit. Uh, We need to sing more hymns like Holy, Holy, Holy. Mm -hmm. Uh, We need to praise God because that's what worship is really supposed to be, Mm -hmm. praising God for who he is. It strikes me that a lot of the quote-unquote newer songs that we sing, Mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes people bemoan those, and, you know, let's go back and sing some of the really older, and and for that matter, some of those 1700s and 1800s songs are very much uh, praise Mm -hmm. kind of songs. But so are some of these newer ones, and yeah. and frankly, a lot of them are just like psalms put to music. Right. Uh, right. It's just it's taken directly from scripture. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, you know, for a long time, that's the only <clears throat> way that people would sing. It was just mm-hmm. to take it directly from the psalms. Mm. Uh, one of my favorite uh, theologians uh, was a German, uh, was a Dutch theologian uh, in the early nineteen uh, hundreds. Mm. And he was accused of liberalism because one day he left the exclusive psalmody position. And he never used instruments in worship, mm. Mm. but he did say that you could write hymns that weren't from Scripture. And mm. So that was that was the liberalism of his time. Wow! But we certainly want to worship appropriately. That's right. And in order to do that, we need to know who God is. Mm-hmm. But we also uh, need to know how God said to worship. Mm. Uh, worship is something that the church does for God primarily. Right. Right. We're going to have some... Uh, fringe benefits. We're going to, you know, like enjoy the wake of this, as yeah. it were. But the primary emphasis of worship should be God. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are not the audience. We are there for Him, and we want to worship the way that He has told us to worship, the way He's instructed us to worship, because worship is for His glory. Worship is for Him. Right. But then, as we continue to worship appropriately, then we benefit as well. You know, mm-hmm. we go back to Romans one. Uh, we see this problem because although they knew him, they didn't honor him as God, and neither were they thankful. Mm. They didn't worship, yeah. and they didn't worship correctly. And so they fall into all sorts of debauchery because they abandoned worship. And mm. So uh, all theology, all of our systematic theology, all of our Bible reading, all of our preaching should always lead to worship. Mm. Uh, at the end of a lot of my sermons, I'll try to have a so what slide. This mm. is what you're supposed to do now. And at the very front of that, I always want to have, you need to worship. Mm. You need to be a, somebody that's living in praise. Uh, we're a royal priesthood, mm-hmm. right? We are supposed to be those people that are continually offering up this sacrifice of praise to our God because we know who he is better. Mm-hmm. We know what's expected of us better. We know who we are better. And so then our worship is better because we better understand God and yeah. we understand what he's told us to do. Mm. I love that. Uh, number seven, right? Is this the last one? Have, or was that the last one? Oh. Did I get off in my numbers? Well, I think we've already been talking about these deep Good. questions that we uh, want to confront, like personhood, government, oh, yes. economics. Um, one of the neat things is to see how much theologians have inf- uh, influenced Western civilization. Mm. Uh, you go back to like John Calvin and right. Martin Luther, who really shaped Western civilization mm. and government. So that's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, but also family, more mm-hmm. important than government. Mm. Uh, our de- identity, gender, uh, eschatology, direction for the future. Uh, but let's look at these two last things. Okay. Uh, number one, uh, or number number 7.8. <laughs> Uh, 7A and 7B. Because we want the church to be united. Uh, Sometimes we look at doctrine as something divisive. but It Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, If we know who God is, it puts us in a rather submissive position to want to do what he wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And so then better knowing who God is, perhaps we can have a more united church family. Perhaps we can have more united congregations because we're not here for what I want. Mm-hmm. We're here for what God wants. We want to glorify him. That becomes the preeminent thing, mm-hmm. that Jesus is king in this congregation. And so we're going to have a better united church, but I think we're also going to have a more growing church mm. because we've got this great news. You know, if you go around preaching, this is what you got to do. Well, that's, that's important and good, mm-hmm. but we might want to preach about Jesus too yeah. um, so that people can say, you know, I believe this. What must I do now? Mm-hmm. Like in Acts 2, we have this biblical model of understanding what God has done, who God is. People are just begging, interrupting the sermon so that they can know what they can do for the Lord and how they can get right with him. Mm-hmm. So I think if we'll focus more on the Lord, think more theologically, mm-hmm. have this uh, better foundation perhaps, that we're going to have a growing church. They're going to be growing closer to God because they're focused on God. Mm-hmm. They're going to want to tell people about God because they're just overwhelmed with God. 
Yeah. Uh, just like, uh, you know, pick on grandparents for a minute. <laughs> but they just love their grandbabies, That's don't right. They? They'll yeah. tell you about their grandbabies all the time. <laughs> Shouldn't we be that way, the Lord? Yeah. And I think maybe part of the reason why we're not is because we don't think about the Lord. Mm. We think about, you know, well, I've done my stuff I've got to do today. Right. But we, we need to fall in love with Jesus. We mm-hmm. need to fall in love with God the Father, God the Spirit, so that we have this relationship that we're just overwhelmed with, and we can't help but talk to people about it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very catchy. That's what the world's looking for. Yeah. Uh, you see people all over. They're looking for direction. They're looking for something. Uh, you have today the... The nuns that we've talked about, the right. religious group that's just not affiliated at all yeah. because they don't have anything to look to. But the new thing is the referred to as the duns. Mm. They've been in church, and especially after corona, they're just done. Right. But I think if we had that relationship, if we knew who God was, we would be so overwhelmed. They would never be done with church. Mm-hmm. We would never be done with the Lord because we love Him, because we are uh, just adoring Him every day. And theology is that very thing that we mm-hmm. need, the study of God so that we know God and we can live for him appropriately. Mm. It strikes me then as as preachers that that's going to mean we have to sort of get over ourselves to some degree. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that means just in terms of nerves, and you alluded to this earlier, you know, maybe we're, uh, we're sort of caught up in the moment. You're standing there in front of people. You're the one who's doing the talking. And maybe with some experience and practice, you know, right. and intentionality, watch the tapes after or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, you can kind of get over that a little bit. Yeah. But more than that, it, it's not about me. It's not about the sermon time is here and now I get to get up and assume right. my even authority over. Right. I, I'm just a conduit, right? Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm trying good. to point people back. You know, a lot of times we've always said in preaching classes or talking about preaching that we want people to leave saying, what a great Savior. Mm-hmm. But what if we actually said things like that in the sermon? That's right. I mean, what mm-hmm. a great God. Look how great God is. Just just how unbelievable it is that we have such a God. Mm-hmm. And we model that in the sermon. We model that in our life that we're continually just overwhelmed with God. Yeah, It's just catchy. You can't help but love it, too. Right. And uh, just I'm, I'm repeating here, but I'm thinking about it as we close the episode. That's that's what the world needs right now. Right. The you world know? doesn't need you. It needs God. That's right. And the quicker yeah. we get around to that, uh, I think the, the better off we'll be yeah. in our own relationship with the Lord. And the church is going to grow. It's going to flourish mm-hmm. because uh, these are these are God's people. Yeah. These are God's people. Well, brother, we appreciate the the insight, uh, it, dipping into a little bit of your uh, academic uh, pursuits and all that you've done, but also uh, uh, the encouragement you've given to us today. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Thank you, Rob. And thanks for everything you do at Fried Hardeman, too, for the appreciate students there. That's great. Yeah, Glad to know that Hardeman. you're there with them. Yeah. Great place. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to thank you for being a part of this edition of Preachers in Training. Quick reminder that you can get in touch with us anytime by uh, emailing us, preachers at thelightnetwork.tv. Also, don't forget our website, thelightnetwork.tv, where you can find previous episodes of this podcast and all the others that are available uh, under the banner of the Light Network. Thanks for being with us today. Hope you'll join us next week. But until then, let's go preach the word. Preach the word.